Hello there, this is Adam from the Video Game Dads podcast. Um, I'm by myself today and decided to record a little bit of a mini episode, so to speak, to fill the gaps between the times when um, Benjamin and Shane and myself can get together. Uh, and on this particular episode, we're going to discuss the Vetrex. So those sounds that you heard at the beginning of this episode are the sweet sounds of the Vetrex. And I have a little bit of personal history with this system of When I was a small child, my grandmother uh, was a nurse and used to take care of hospice patients and patients near the end of life and and, uh, sort of traveled around between people's homes. And on occasion, she would have to watch me uh, while she did this, so she would take me along. And there was a a woman in particular, an elderly woman, um, who had a room in her house for her grandchild. And these uh, folks were fairly well-to-do, and and I remember being able to, she would tell me to go play in this room whenever uh, my grandmother would come to help take care of her. And in, in this grandchild's room, there were just probably 50 NES games and all sort of top end games. And I remember he had to rob the robot with Stack Up and a lot of other things that, you know, we couldn't necessarily afford when we were kids. But over in the corner, he had this really strange thing which looked like a little sideways television in a black box and had really bright graphics with lines on it. And I remember at the time, I thought that it was some sort of Atari or or something else, and I really didn't know what it was, but I do remember playing um, the Asteroids clone game that was on it. And I never, it was the only time I'd ever seen that system, and I I never saw it since uh, until I became an adult, and I actually own one now. Um, But that system was the Vetrex, and I remember being kind of awestruck by it and not really able to understand it. I'd never seen anything quite like it. It was a self-contained thing in a box. Um, the system and the, and the television put together, but it didn't look or operate like any television I had ever seen. So we're going to dive a little bit further into the Vetrex and discuss that more in detail in this mini episode. So first, let's talk a little bit about what the Vetrex is. Um, it's a very unique system, and uh, so far as I know, it's the only one that's really like it. Um, it's uh, it's it's very unique. It has its own little uh, screen that's built into it. Um, an 11 by 9 inch screen and it's a it's a vector monitor so if you can think of old uh, arcade games things like uh, asteroids or missile command um, battle zone uh, any of those old games that had the lines that were that were really bright and sharp on those um, those are vector monitors and and the other thing that you can think of as well is is um, monitors from old uh, television shows uh, in hospitals, the ones that would show the EKG or the heart rhythms, um, those oftentimes, uh, back in the olden days, were all vector monitors. Of course, now all those are LCDs, just like everything else. Um, but but vector monitors are what basically started out in the arcades, and this was a vector monitor for home. They um, the idea was to provide an arcade-like experience at the house, and if you were in the early 80s, that was uh, about as arcade perfect as you can be. I, I don't want to get into too much detail, uh, partially because I don't fully understand it myself, but these monitors are a lot different than the raster monitor of like a CRT television or a tube television, which scans back and forth across the t- television screen, uh, you know, 30 or 60 times a second. Uh, back and forth and horizontal lines up and down the, the field to create a, an image. Um, these monitors only send light to specific coordinates on a, on a screen and therefore concentrate that light in very precise areas and, and consequently have very, very sharp graphics and very, very bright graphics. Um, I have an Asteroids arcade cabinet as well in my basement and it's just amazing how bright the monitor is on that and how well defined the graphics are. And the Vetrix actually does a lot of those same things. Um, aside from like a, a 4K television or, or some very modern display, the, the graphics are just amazingly sharp. I'm much sharper than any uh, CRT or raster display uh, that you can have from the time. Um, as far as the, the system itself, it's... Uh, as I said previously, it's all self-contained. It has a has a three-inch paper speaker, and when you turn the monitor on or turn the system on, you'll hear that sort of buzzing, popping sound. And the reason for that is because the internal shielding within the hardware um, isn't adequate to to keep the electronics in the device from actually affecting its own speaker. So that buzzing sound is interference from itself, which is which is kind of funny uh, in, in a way. Um, the Vetrex uh, came pre-packaged with a single game um, called Mindstorm, and Mindstorm is basically a straight ripoff uh, of Asteroids. Um, and the game that I had played at that house I was speaking of earlier was at Mindstorm. So one of the things that makes the Vetrex really unique is it had its own boot-up screen, 
And if you did not have a cartridge plugged into the machine, it would automatically boot Mindstorm, and that's what you would play. Um, so far as I know, it's it's probably the first system that had either one of those two things, a boot-up screen or a system uh, game built into it that would play if you didn't have another game plugged in. Um, as you may or may not know, some of the Sega Master System versions had various games on them as well uh, that will play if you don't have a cartridge inserted into the system. Um, the Vetrix was somewhat limited during its run. It, it came out in, in 1982, uh, just before Christmas in November, I believe, um, and <clears throat> only lasted a couple of years. It, it came out in 82, and then subsequently during the uh, video game crash of 1983, uh, which is usually attributed to Atari, but they weren't the only ones, um, uh, when, it, when everything went bad, uh, that the Vetrex and, and the company that owned Vetrex, GCE, essentially got bought out by Milton Bradley, who subsequently uh, distributed the console in North America and Europe and sold the rights to it uh, in Japan to Bandai, who, who distributed uh, in, in Japan. Um, the, the system itself was developed by, a, by an engineering firm called Smith Technologies, which subsequently sold uh, the system to GCE. There were only uh, 28 or 29 games ever released for the system, uh, depending on how you want to count. Um, and all of the uh, original games released for the system were all published by GZE. So there were no third-party supports. There's no Konamis. There's no Capcoms. There's no other companies that really, you know, developed games for the Vetrex. Uh, one of the interesting things about the Vetrex is that they still make games for it. There's still homebrew games that come out for it. And um, the games, um, either in the late 80s or early 90s, actually... Uh, came into public domain. There are uh, emulators and ways to play them uh, online without actually owning the console, um, but I'm sure that none of those uh, actually compare to playing it on the uh, on the original console itself. Another interesting thing about the console is that it's actually very light, and on the back of it, it has a built-in handle, and you can pick it up and take it over to a friend's house. The controller actually flips in to the console at the base of the monitor, so the controller is self-contained, and you actually have to have a second controller to plug into it if you want to play a two-player game. Um, another interesting thing um, about the Vetrex is it had a couple of uh, very unique uh, peripherals at the time. So the first was a light pin, um, and the light pin actually allowed you to touch this device to the screen and draw your own lines, draw, draw your, own, your own pictures, if you will, on the screen um, with, this, with this input device that would tell the the monitor where to where to send the, the picture output and you could draw your own you know rudimentary um, uh, line graphics uh, kind of like a, a pre uh, Microsoft paint if you will but and probably the most interesting feature is that um, near the end of the Vetrex life cycle uh, at least in North America it was not released in Europe or, or Japan they, they released something called the 3d imager and the 3d imager is actually 3d glasses it was the first real step of a home console into uh, virtual reality and it uses a shutter type uh, display similar to what the Famicom used in Japan or um, the Sega Master System used with its uh, display but both of those came several years after um, but this thing actually was capable of, of 3D uh, image creation and I I don't own a 3D imager I would certainly like to to mess with one but from what I understand that it actually does make a, a pretty convincing uh, 3D uh, effect and so that's that's really kind of neat and something very unique for the time um, the Vetrex basically lasted until about 1984 uh, when it was um, ceased to be uh, produced and, and Milton Bradley subsequently I guess lost a lot of money on the endeavor um, there were some talks about reviving the Vetrex towards the late 80s early 90s um, possibly as a handheld device but none of that ever came to to anything the, the monitor itself, if you have ever seen an Asteroids cabinet or even Missile Command, sometimes you'll think about it being colored uh, or having colors in the graphics. All of these vector monitors actually are only black and white, so they're, they're monochrome black and white. But um, if you ever run across a Vetrex game, the games originally came packaged with, a, with an overlay, basically film that was co uh, colored, kind of like the Magnavox Odyssey, and uh, you can put those on the screen, the screen has little clips on it, and that, that actually gives the appearance of color. Um, uh, 
So if you ever see one of these out in the wild, uh, that's one thing to ask about or, or at least to look for. And the games are completely playable without those overlays, but the, the overlays are kind of neat uh, just as an addition um, to, to uh, you know, being able to, to experience the games as they were meant to be experienced. Um, one of the funny things about some of the games are that the overlays don't necessarily 100% correspond or, or uh, really lay out to, to some of the graphics in some of the games. And, and part of it was because there was a programmer programming the game, and sometimes they would send the specifications off to someone else who was making the overlay, and, and uh, the overlay, of course, would be printed someplace else and maybe before the software was, was completely uh, completed and those sorts of things. So sometimes the overlays don't exactly match up, which actually leads to a little bit more of a nostalgic impact, I think. Um, so, you know, in short, that's, that's mostly what I wanted to talk to you about the Vetrex. Uh, I'll link a, a video uh, from the gaming historian, one of our buddies, uh, that he did on the Vetrex a, a while back that gives a, a, a more full explanation. Also, it allow you to, to see it and see the graphics of it. Just as an aside, we wanted to do these mini episodes basically so that we would be putting out content and be able to change gears a little bit, maybe talk about something historic or just something that's, you know, relatively interesting that doesn't require all three of us to get together. If this is a good idea, great, let me know. Uh, if you hate it and think I should never make another one of these again, I guess uh, send me an email on that as well. But it's been kind of fun and, and uh, hopefully uh, has given you an insight into something that you may not have known about in the past. If you're ever out and about and actually see one at a garage sale or a swap meet or a flea market, um, and you can get it for cheap, uh, certainly uh, get it. it. They're they're really, really neat, and there's really nothing else that's that's exactly like them. Um, they have a very loyal, uh, dedicated fan base, and, and uh, they're just really cool. Um, and they make awesome sounds. Uh, that's one of the things about them is the sounds really, really take you back. Thank you for listening, and, and I hope you have a good day. Please give us a like on Facebook at facebook.com slash video game dads. Follow us on Twitter at, at video game dads or send us an email at video game dads at yahoo.com. Thank you. If you enjoyed that music, please check out Evan King on Bandcamp for further details, and you can download some for yourself. Thank you. Bye-bye.